animals. You've been waiting for this moment, and here it is. This week, we learn all about the kingdom animalia. So in that video, did you recognize most of the animals that you saw? So cute, right? Cuddly, adorable, perhaps. What about these animals on the slide? Yes, these are actually animals. Do you recognize them? Really? Most people wouldn't recognize these animals or even realize that they are animals. So pictured on the left, you see this animal that's red. This animal is called a Christmas tree worm. That makes sense, it looks like a Christmas tree. However, most people would mistake that for a plant. Do you see that this worm has a, a head there? I circled it. How about the animal on the right? Do you recognize this animal? This is a lamprey. A lamprey is a jawless fish. They also recog uh, recognized as the oldest lineage of all vertebrates. So this animal would be classified as a vertebrate. In general, that refers to animals that have a backbone. The Christmas tree worm would be classified as an invertebrate. These are animals that do not have a backbone. To be an animal, these are multicellular eukaryotes that do not have cell walls. The cells within animal bodies are organized. In most animals, this forms tissues. Tissues are groups of cells that have a, a cooperative function. Those tissues can organize into organs and organ systems. Most animals have movement. They have muscle tissue and nervous tissue that coordinate to allow for movement. Although in some of the very primitive animals, the movement was limited to just their reproductive cells. All animals are heterotrophs. And that means that they have to consume other cells or organic material in order to make their ATP energy. Most animals reproduce sexually where diploid offspring are the result of sexual reproduction. Some animals reproduce asexually, meaning that they can clone themselves and many animals can regenerate. You can cut the arm off of a starfish and the starfish will regenerate that arm. In some species of worms, you can cut off their head and that worm will not only regenerate its head, but it will regenerate a new body from the severed head. In this video, we're gonna learn about animal classification and how we name living things in biology. Animals are classified further by their body symmetry, as well as certain key events that occurred during their embryonic development. First, let's talk about the taxonomic hierarchy that we use in biology. This is a classification uh, grouping system that is recognized among all biologists all over the world. So in the previous weeks, we've been discussing the concept of domains. There are three domains of life on Earth that are recognized currently by biologists. The first two do domains are prokaryotes, domain bacteria, and domain archaea. In the last few videos, we've been studying the domain eukarya. The domain eukarya is further subclassified into four kingdoms. In the previous lecture videos, we've discussed kingdom protista, kingdom fungi, and kingdom plantae. 
So now we are on to the fourth kingdom in the domain Eukarya. Here you can see on the slide that this classification system that I'm about to describe starts with the term domain. Domain is the broadest term that we have in the classification of life on Earth. And we're going to write that into the top box. So notice here we are we are showing you the classification of a particular animal, this fish. So this is in the domain Eukarya. The domain Eukarya arose about 2 billion years ago. And rec is recognized to have um, 5 million different species. So within the domain Eukarya, we are studying here the kingdom Animalia. The kingdom Animalia evolved 600 million years ago and represents about 1 million species. Under, under king kingdom, we have phylum. This fish is located in the phylum chordata. Chordates are invertebrates as well as uh, mostly vertebrate animals. And this phylum evolved 525 million years ago and composes about 50,000 different species of chordates. Within the phylum, we have a class. So, so we're getting more and more narrowed down as we go. And you can see that in the pictures of the animals here, where we're seeing that we're, we have fewer and fewer animals in this diagram as we go down in classification towards a more narrow classification. So domain is a very broad term, and we're going down here towards a more narrow classification. Okay, so underneath class, we would have order. Order persiformes. Family. Family pomacentridae. Now we're only at 360 members of this family pomacentridae. A lot of this term, these terms are difficult to pronounce. Um, a lot of them have Latin derivatives, which is why they're difficult to pronounce. The next classification category is genus. Now we're down to just two fish in our picture, although it's showing us there are approximately 28 species within the genus Amphiprion. The last box is for species. Species is Ocellaris. So the scientific name of an organism is recognized as the genus and the species. So let's highlight that here. So the genus and the species here would be the scientific name. So it's always the genus and the species. Sort of like how you have your first name and your last name. And if I just refer to you by your first name, if someone else in the class had your first name, you would know which of you I was calling on. So the last name helps us to further classify who we're talking about here. So here, this would be Let's rewrite it here. So we're saying this is in the Amphiprion genus. And the genus is always given a capital letter. And the species is always given a lowercase letter, Ocellaris. Now, technically, the scientific name also needs to be either underlined or italicized to be correct. So when we're not using a computer and we're just handwriting, we would underline 
to indicate it as a scientific name. Or if you're writing it on a computer, you will see it italicized. So that is the scientific name. The scientific name is useful because if you're a scientist that lives in another country like Germany or Japan or China or Saudi Arabia, and your spoken language is different than other parts of the world, all scientists use the same scientific language. So regardless of your common language, everybody in the scientific community would understand who we're talking about if we talk about Amphiprion acellaris. But if you live in a country where you talk regularly about certain organisms and you talk about them in the in the native language of that country, we call that the common name. So this is what we would call the animal or a plant, okay, or a protist. We use the same class or a bacteria. We use the same classification system for all life on the planet. All of the three domains we could fit into something like this uh, with some modifications within the prokaryotes, but in general, this is the order of classification. Okay, so common name is native language. What is the native language or the spoken language of that particular country or where the scientist lives? So the common name for Amphiprion acellaris is the clownfish. You knew that, right? You've seen Finding Nemo. One more thing, let's highlight scientific name here so we can make the connection there. So I would like you to know the hierarchy of taxonomy from domain to species. I would also like you to know the classification for humans. You know, you're a human. <laughs> you should know what your classification is. So we are in the domain Eukarya. The kingdom Animalia, the phylum Chordata, the class Mammalia, we are mammals, okay, we are chordates with a backbone, okay, we're in the order primates, shared with other primates, like gorillas and orangutans, chimpanzees, we are in the family Hominidae. We are in the genus Homo. We are the only surviving species within the family Hominidae and the genus Homo. Although historically, and we've talked about it in the evolution lectures, we did coexist with other, what we call hominids, in um, historic times going back hundreds of thousands of years ago um, and today we are the only species so of uh, hominids that walk the earth and we are homo oops, homo sapiens so what's our scientific name That's right, our scientific name would be Homo sapiens. You sometimes also see that genus, uh, you either see it written out fully or just the first letter capitalized. So like H sapiens would also be a way to write the scientific name. Next, I wanna show you the phylogenetic tree that we share with all animals. And so this phylogenetic tree describes that there are nine animal phyla. These nine animal phyla will be discussed in the next few lecture videos. So recall when we have been studying phylogenetic trees, these trees begin with a common ancestor shared by all organisms in the tree. 
So the common ancestor that all animals share is recognized as an ancestral flagellate. It was an animal-like protist. Remember, those protists, they rec are represent evolutionary precursors of the kingdoms in the domain Eukarya. So the ancestral flagellate, this common ancestor that all animals share, lived approximately 600 million years ago. So all animals evolved from this common ancestor. We'll talk more about it in the next video. So let me introduce you to our family, our family tree within the, within the phy phylum, sorry, within the kingdom animalia. So the, the nine different phyla, so in order, so from the ancestral flagellate, we have the phylum periphera, which includes sponges, the phylum cnidaria, which include jellyfish, Fly, phylum platyhelminthes, flatworms, phylum nematoda, roundworms. Here we see a branching event. To the right, we see phylum, phylum mollusca, things like clams and snails and octop octopuses and slugs. Then we see the phylum annelida. These are segmented worms, like earthworms. Then we see the phylum arthropoda. These are things like insects and crustaceans. Over here, we see, going to the left, we see the phylum Echinodermata. The echinoderms are things like starfish and um, sand dollars. Lastly, we see the phylum Chordata. So the animals that I've highlighted in the tree, well, they all represent a grouping of animals we call invertebrates. Invertebrates are animals without a backbone. Which composes actually all nine of the animal phyla. However, for phylum chordata, let's make a notation here in phylum chordata that there are some, very few, there are some invertebrate animals that are classified within the phylum chordata. But the majority of animals in the phylum chordata are classified as vertebrates. So these are animals with a backbone. And these are classified only within the phylum chordata. Next, let's talk about animal classification by embryonic development. So animals like other sexually reproduced, uh, reproducing organisms are a product of a sperm cell that combined with an egg cell. And that first cell of the, uh, of the uh, developing embryo is called a zygote. Recall, we used that same terminology last week when we talked about plants. Um, in animal development, following the zygote development and several rounds of mitosis, the um, blastula represents an early stage to the embryo. So this blastula here is an early stage embryo. Notice it's composed of a cell layer. So it's no longer a single cell like the zygote. Let's backtrack a minute. So zygote is one cell and backtrack from there, the zygote originated from the egg cell that then was fertilized by a sperm cell.
then that zygote grows by mitosis for a few days and we get the blastula. This eventually results in a process we call gastrulation. Gastrulation is the process by which the blastula embryo differentiates into what we call now the gastrula. The gastrula is now beginning to become more specific in the types of cells that it will become when it grows into the uh, adult stage. So we recognize that there are three potential layers of cells that can differentiate into different parts of the animal body. Some animals at this stage only have two tissue layers. We call them diploblastic. The tissues that the diploblasts have are the endoderm and the ectoderm. Other animals form all three of the uh, layers of cells and we call them triploblastic. Triplo, like the word tri, which means three, means that all three of the layers of cells are found in the gastrula, the endoderm, the mesoderm, and the ectoderm. Now these layers will differentiate into different parts of the animal body as this animal goes through embryonic development and then fetal development, and then eventually is born. We recognize that the ectoderm um, re refers to the cells that will become the skin, the brain, and the central nervous system. The mesoderm, I always remember that for M like muscle. So muscle, and of course heart, because heart is a muscle, but also bone. And then endoderm, endo like inside. And that refers to the lining of your intestinal tract, your gastrointestinal tract, as well as the lungs. So most animals are triploblasts. There's only one group that's actually classified as diploblastic, and these are the cnidarians, which include things like the jellyfish. So triploblasts would be all other animals with the exception of sponges. Now, as this embryo continues to divide, and you remember this process because I showed you the process of development in a salamander on YouTube when we covered mitosis. You don't remember? Don't worry, we'll take a look. So now we're seeing this gastrulation process occurring and the folding so the different germ layers are forming now within the gastrula. Pretty soon a big folding event is going to occur. There it goes. There's another big fold. So all these foldings are occurring during this embryonic development stage. Eventually the different tissues decide which part of the body they're going to become and differentiation of those tissues occurs. This has been time-lapsed much faster than its actual speed, but now we see the salamander emerge from the sac. Okay, so that gives you a visual of what's being shown in this diagram. 
the development stages of the embryo from the time that the embryo is a tiny ball of cells that we call a gastrula, and then it begins to fold in on itself. Now, this folding is going to produce an opening here. We call this opening a blastopore. Okay, so now what is that little pore going to become? Uh, the classification of that further subdivides animals into two categories. Either the blastopore becomes the mouth first and then the anal opening. Remember, this blastopore is shown here with the yellow cells. The yellow cells are the endoderm. And remember, the endoderm is going to form the GI tract. This is your intestines. So if that opening forms the mouth first, we call this animal a protostome. Protostome means first mouth. If the blastopore develops first into the anus, the anal opening, and then the mouth opening second, that animal is called a deuterostome. Deuterostrum literally means second mouth. It means that the anal opening forms first and the mouth opening forms second. So animals are further subclassified based on this uh, differentiation during embryonic development. So there are only two groups of animals that are called deuterostomes. Those are echinoderms like starfish and chordates. Remember, we are a chordate. So those animals share this evolutionary relationship. All other um, uh, animals, which include five different groupings, are called protostomes. So this includes the arthropods, the annelids, the flatworms, the roundworms, and the mollusks. Animals are also classified by something we call body symmetry. In the case of sponges, there is no symmetry. Asymmetrical means no symmetry. Hydra is an example of a cnidarian. Cnidarians have something we call radial symmetry. What that means is the body of that animal can be divided at the central axis into equal parts. Most other animals are what we call bilateral. Notice that word bi means two. It means if you can divide that animal in half, the left and the right sides are actually identical, mirror images rather, uh, of each other. Just like if you put your, if you thought about dividing your body in half down the middle, you would have an equal side where your hands and your feet are mirror images of each other.